It's good to see you all this morning. <clears throat> I appreciate your singing, the heal, the participation of the prayers that have been offered. Brother David, his prayer mentioned the gifts that God has given for us. This morning, Lord willing, I'd like to speak to you concerning the gifts that God gives to us. In Romans chapter 11, verse number 29, the Apostle Paul tells us that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That means what he gives to us, he gives to us in a permanent way. Our God is a God that does not change. Malachi tells us in Malachi 3 and 6, he quotes God, says, uh, um, um, and your God, and, and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Tell us that we have a God, when he makes a decision, you ever have to, you ever make a decision, and then you have to go back and change your decision, you change your mind, gain more information, where our God never gains more information. He sees and knows the end from the beginning. So that that he's given is permanent. Now these gifts... These gifts um, can be categorized in, in several ways, but for this morning's subject, I'd like to break them down in three different categories. One is the gift that's considered an estate gift. That means the gift that God has given to us, which makes us forever his children. We'll call those estate gifts. The other is... Um, Functional gifts, that is, gifts that God gives to us that enables us to serve Him, that equips us, gives us talents to serve among His people and to serve His name. The other gift category is the gift of material things or practical things in this life. Things that God does for us that we simply cannot do for ourselves. Helps us. I'd like to address the last one first. In Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, Jesus Christ says this, and I use this often for myself. The Lord speaking, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He says, And I will. The next word is give. That means that which... He communicates from himself to us. It's a gift. And I will give you rest. That means when the burdens and the troubles and the trials of this life are so great that you feel overwhelmed and cannot over possibly overcome them yourselves, the Lord says, come to me and I'll give you rest. That means I will give you peace right in the midst of your troubles. Those things that are overwhelming you, I will deliver you from them, or deliver you through them. He says, take my yoke upon you, that means submit to my authority over you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls. That means a soul that is troubled can find rest in the person of Jesus Christ. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, in a discourse on gifts that God gives, he compares the gifts that parents give to their children. If you order your children is hungry, you're going to give that child something to eat. When we were children at home, and we, we always had a lot of people coming in and out of our home and taking meals to church, uh, it, cooking was a constant exercise at our house. And if one of us children were hungry and we went through the kitchen, mom, and when mom knew that we were hungry, she would sliver off a little piece of that fried chicken or a piece of her ham and give it to us. And she'd, she'd say, now, shh, and tell anybody. But she was just very kind and loving to us. 
So the Lord uses that as an analogy. He says, if your parents know how to be kind and gracious to you, he says, listen to this, if you then, being evil by our very nature, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? He says, how much, if your parents know how to be good and kind and loving and generous to you, how much more so do you think your God, the Father, will be to you to give you good things? Jesus Christ, just hours before he was crucified, in John chapter 14, he, uh, he's comforting his apostles who were in great distress at his leaving. In John chapter 14, in verse number 27, Jesus Christ tells them that he's going to give them something. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I give it to you. I bless you with it. It's a gift from me to you. You're of a troubled heart now. And when our hearts are troubled in this life, oftentimes... We look around and we find something or someone to comfort us, and there is no one. Sometimes we can get so distressed in this life that even the best comfort from the best comforters is no comfort at all. Have you ever been in that kind of condition? I have. But there's one who can cut through the fog of our distress and our pain and our anguish, and he can command peace be still. And there's comfort and there's peace right in the midst of the storms of our life. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He says, keep your focus on me in the midst of your troubles. Now we could go on with that. Actually, these subjects concerning the gifts, uh, we could spread them out over about six weeks worth of preaching. But if the Lord be willing, I want to cover them all this morning. The next is the estate gift. Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter, the gospel account of John chapter 10. This is the good shepherd chapter. I'd like to direct your attention directly to verse number 27 for the sake of time. These are gifts that your Lord has given to you. These are estate gifts. And by the way, these gifts are not offered. Material gifts, you could probably make a, a case that if you've been really going to eat it, you shall eat the good of the land. But these are in an endowments. That means these gifts are gifts that God just bestows upon you. You didn't ask for them, but he gave them to you. You cannot acquire them on your own. He simply endowed you with them. Jesus Christ is addressing himself as the good shepherd and his sheep as my sheep. He says in John chapter 10, verse number 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He's describing here a loving relationship that he has with his sheep. He says, I speak and I love my sheep. The sheep that I love knows that I love them when they hear my voice. And they follow my voice because they love me. And by the way, he tells us in other places, in another place, that we love him because he first loved us. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Then in verse number 28, he tells us about the gift. And I give unto them what? Eternal life. This is an endowment by God. I give unto them eternal life. Notice, he didn't say, and I offer unto them eternal life. I give it to them. I endow them with it. They are mine, and I have placed it within them. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That doesn't say, and they shall never die, because our body dies, but we'll never perish, because when we die, he will take our spirit to be with him in paradise until the day, great day of the resurrection of the dead, when he reunites the spirit with the body, and then we, body, soul, and spirit will be caught up together with him in the air, and so shall we ever be with our Lord. This is a, our eternal life is an endowment 
from God Almighty through our Lord Jesus Christ. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That means you are eternally secure with this gift. Now, Romans chapter 5, turn there with me just briefly. This is a little gift of doctrine. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 15. We'll touch verses 15 and 18. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 15. He says, But now, as uh, not as the offense, so also is the free what? Gift. Now this is a free gift to you. But you know that even if you give somebody a gift and it's free to them, is it free to you? It cost you, didn't it? This gift is free to us, but it costs Jesus Christ miserably. The suffering on the cross, it cost him. It cost him to be made to be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, to be made for sin, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace. If this gift is by grace, that means he has gifted you or endowed you with something that you do not deserve. And the gift by grace, which is by one man, one single Uno, one, a unit, one. You have this gift because Jesus Christ has endowed it to you uh, himself and it cost him, one man, the price of his sacrifice to give you this gift. If it is by one man, what does that mean? No human being can give you this gift. No human being can secure this gift for you. No human being can endow you with this gift. So any who claim that they can uh, purify you, justify you, or glorify you for heaven by some act upon, uh, of themselves, their declaration is not consistent with the Word of God. Let me put it that way. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Skip on down to verse number 18. Listen to this now. Therefore, as by the offense of how many? One. By the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That offense, that offender was Adam. When Adam sinned, death and the penalty of sin came upon all human beings. Judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so by the Watch carefully now. By the righteousness of one. If you're righteous this morning, you're righteous because Jesus Christ has endowed you with his righteousness. He has gifted his righteousness to you. Three times the prophet Jeremiah referred to him as the Lord our righteousness. And what does that word mean? It sounds good. Does it? It's poetic in this sound. Righteousness. But what that means is that you are right with God. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, not because of anything that you have done, you are right with God. Now watch this. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That means all the men, all the people, the, uh, the men, women, and children, that man, word men there means mankind. That means he has endowed you with righteousness, thus making you fit for eternal life with him in heaven. Now, chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. Verse number 23, go directly there. Now, there is something we can earn in this life. What's this? Romans 6, and verse number 23. For the wages of sin is death. You know what wages are? I remember 
when the minimum wage was $1.45 an hour. Some of us in this room can remember when there was no minimum age, wage. I worked hard for $1.45 an hour. Very hard. And I always looked for that paycheck that paid me for my work. That was a wage. We earn, watch this now, let's read it again. For the wages of sin is death. That means what we earn as a result of sin is death. By one man, in chapter 5, Paul tells us sin entered into the world and death by sin. Then Paul also tells us in chapter 3, for we have all what? Sin and come short of the glory of God. The result of that is death. What does death mean? Death means a separation from a close relationship with God. That's what Adam suffered in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus Christ restored that relationship when he declared while hanging on the cross, it is finished. For the wages of sin is death, but in contrast to the wages, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We earn death by our sin, but the gift, the endowment of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We earn death. You don't earn eternal life. Jesus Christ earned that for you. And he gifted it to you. Amen. Is that good news? That's the reason they call it the gospel. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, has done for us. Amen. Then the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Paul says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the what? Yeah. Guilt of God. And it's not of what? Works, lest any man should what? Boast. And it is said that way because... I guarantee you, if we could earn our eternal relationship with God, we would boast about it. That's the way human people are. I could give you some illustrations, but don't, just don't, don't want to tarry with it. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn with there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 1. These gifts are described in multiple ways throughout the Scripture. Why don't you go with me to verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. Paul says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. He's gifted you with this. He's gifted you with power. He's gifted you with love and a sound mind. You know, all kinds of jokes may be made about this, but this is, this is no joking matter. This is a very serious matter. This is what God has given to his children so that we can serve and worship him. This is the God, verse number 8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. That means be ready to suffer in this life for the privilege of uh, serving our God. Now watch this. God who hath saved us. That means he's endowed you with salvation and called us. That means he's endowed you with calling. He has called you to spiritual life. You know, one of the questions that modern Christianity asks is this. Have you been born again? And the idea behind that is if you haven't, we need to get it done. Well, if you read the description of spiritual birth in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, you'll find that it is clear there that spiritual life is an act of the Holy Spirit, and the, it's like the, the wind that bloweth, and no man knows where it's coming from, knows where it's going. It's an act of God, and you are the simple recipients of it. Amen. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, and it's not according to our works. We did not do anything uh, to make ourselves fit or saved to heaven, nor to call us to spiritual life, but, it's a co uh, but, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was what? What's the next word? 
It was given as a gift or an endowment to us, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? If you could work your way to heaven or to righteousness fit for heaven, you would have had to have done it before the foundation of the world. Your eternal relationship with God is an endowment given to you by God. Titus chapter 1, the very next book in the Bible. Titus chapter 1. Paul says here, he starts off, Paul, a servant of God. I like that. Paul, a servant of God. I mean, I, my whole purpose in life is to serve God. What is your purpose in life? Your number one purpose in life. I trust that in your mind, you're saying my number one purpose is to serve my God. To serve my God before me or anyone else. Serve my God. That's number one. If it's not, there will come a day when it will be. Someone who is at the very point of death when they know it. There's one predominant thought on their mind and that is my God. My God. What can I say to glorify my God? Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope, are you ready? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot what? Say it out loud. Which cannot what? He cannot lie. Promise. When did he promise it? Before the world began. It's an endowment given to you by the authority and power of God before the world began began. Now, one more. James chapter 1. Go with me to James chapter 1. One more. As we endeavor to consider the estate gifts that God our Father has given to us. James chapter 1 and verse number 17. James says, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. That means you didn't get these gifts on your own. You didn't earn them. You didn't secure them. No one on this earth gave them to you. He says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That means this God that doesn't change has given you this gift. So let me ask you this question. Is it possible that you could lose the gift of eternal life? No. No. It is eternally secure in the Lord our God himself. Now, I'd like to shift now and consider for a little while the functional gifts that God has given to you. Now, to lay the groundwork for the functional gifts, would you turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, in verse number 10, the Apostle Paul says, watch carefully now, For we are his workmanship created in, in uh, Christ Jesus. And why did he create us? He created us unto what? Good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God has said it, that we should walk in good works in the service. So our purpose is to walk in good works in the service of of our God. Now, I want you to stay in that chapter and go uh, to verse number 19. Considering that the pur- your purpose here is to do good works in the service of your God. Verse number 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. He's talking about it in the church of Jesus Christ. You're not a stranger and you're not a foreigner. That means if you're not a stranger and you're not a foreign, foreigner, you are at home, Right? That means you're among family. You're among those who have the same father that you have. That's why when visitors come to be with us, we sing that song about our heavenly family. Because we perceive ourselves to be the children of the Most High God. He's our heavenly father, and we're brothers and sisters together. And so I have traveled the first time that I went to the state of Indiana where Sister Laura's from, 
The first church that I attended up there was Fort Wayne Primitive Baptist Church. That was a long time ago. I weighed 224 pounds then and had a full head of hair. That was a long time ago. I walked in the door and those sweet people embraced me and took me in and treated me like one of their own. And I think it was the third trip up there, I met Elder Tommy Sarber. And he's been my brother and my friend ever since then. He says, now there, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Now listen now, we're talking about the gifts that he's given us to use and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom, watch, watch carefully now, in whom all the building fitly framed together. That means every one of you have a fit place in the house of God. Every one of you are fitted for a place in the house of God. I understand when they built the first temple under Solomon's rule, that every stone, and those stones were huge, every stone was fit, cut, and prepared for its place in the temple. They transported that huge stone, and when it got there, there was already a place for it. And it fit perfectly. The children of God are that way. We are fitly framed, put together in the house of God, and it groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. That means that when everybody is using their God-given gifts, as God intended for us to, as we're using those gifts, the church is going to grow. Are you with me? That means whatever gift God has given to you, you use that and your church is going to grow. Fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together as an habitation of God through the Spirit. That means God comes and lives with you. He spends time with you. He fills you with his joy and his peace and his happiness. Now, we've got to move. Stay in Ephesians. Let's start here in chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Talking about the gifts that God endows us with that we can live with in this life and use in this life. Start with verse number 8. Ephesians 4 and verse number 8. Wherefore he saith... When he ascended up on high, the Lord said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity to that and did what? Gave what? Gifts unto men. We've already talked about the estate gifts and the material gifts that he gives us. This is a different kind of gift. Verse number 9. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is he that also ascended up above all heavens, that he might fill all things... Paul inserts that to tell you who he's talking about that's giving you this gift. He's emphasizing the gravity of the truth that Jesus Christ is your Savior. He's gifted you. Watch now. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, he gave the apostles the office of the apostle was those twelve men, including Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, they were especially gifted to do extraordinary things as apostles of Jesus Christ. The word apostle literally is translated from a word that means one sent to do a purpose by God. That's what it literally means. Now, we'll, I'll show you again in a moment. We'll, we'll come back, uh, back to that in a moment. But those apostles were men who did a specific thing. The church was being established and growing out of Jerusalem, and they did their job. A prophet, now, in the greater sense of the word the prophet, the word prophet means one who can foretell the future, right? But you know that word comes from another word that literally means speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. 
That's what that word means. When a preacher rises up before you and begins to preach the gospel, you better pray that he is prophesying, that is preaching the word that the Spirit of God has given to him to declare to you. Okay? Now, we'll come back to that again in a moment. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. Uh, to be an evangelist is somewhat like being an apostle. That means God sent, with respect to the preachers, God sends a preacher to where he would have him to go to preach the gospel that he gives to him to the people that God decides who needs it. That means that you as a church can't get together and say, I, you know, I've heard there's some folks over here in, in another state that, that, that needs a church. But I'm, we, we as a church are going to send uh, somebody over there to establish a church. You know it don't happen that way? God moves in the heart of His minister. The Spirit directs Him directly. And when He gets to where He sent, He will find there the reason that He was sent there. Okay? That's an evangelist. So let me ask you this morning. Are you evangelical? Does that mean? I don't care what everybody how You know people misuse the words of the Bible? Yes. And I don't have time for it. We are evangelical because we believe that God sends His ministers. He equips them and gifts them and moves within them to go wherever He directs them to go to preach the gospel to a people that is prepared to hear it. So are you evangelical this morning? So claim the word. It's a biblical word. It's your word. But be ready to define it. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's the same person. Pastors. You know what the word pastor, or you know where that word comes from? Yes, close. Shepherd. Shepherd. So let me ask you the question again. Where does the word pastor come from? Shepherd. shepherd. And what does the shepherd do? Drive his sheep? Let me tell you a little secret. When this church first called me as a pastor in October 1988, I was still on active duty in the military. In the military, you tell somebody to do something, and how many options do they have? Not many. You command them, and they're obligated to obey your command. Let me ask you to guess. How long do you think that that lasted here? Not very long. Now, Brother Rufus Jordan, bless his sweetheart, he reminded me another time, very discreetly, quietly, and lovingly. He says, you're not a captain here. <laughs> I was learning what it meant to be a shepherd. There's a difference between driving and leading. That's what a pastor is. And a man has to be gifted by God to be a, a pastor. He gave some pastors, and in that office is teachers. One who teaches the Word of God. Certainly preaching is teaching, but all teaching is not preaching. You understand me? Amen. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So why these gifts? So we'll see them again in a moment. Why these gifts? Why did he give the gift, these gifts to the church? He says, for the perfecting of the saints. That means to equip you with the Word of God. That's what the word perfected means. To give you the Word of God that you need in this life. And for the work of the ministry. That word ministry, we'll come to that one again in a moment. That word ministry means to serve. That means for serving one another and serving God for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of, of, of the body of Christ. That means to build up the body of Christ. One of the, the, the purposes of preaching is to build you up. I don't mean to do a Zig Ziglar building up to make you feel good about yourself. As a matter of fact, most preaching makes me feel bad about myself. Paul says, In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, O wretched man that I am. But what makes me feel bad about myself makes me feel good about my Lord. It builds me up in my Lord and gives me a strong and a secure hope in Him. Amen. And pastor teachers are to do this, to preach and teach uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. That is the faith, not a faith. That is, there's only one faith in this context. That is one gospel of Jesus Christ 
And in the unity of the faith, that means we all come to the point where we understand and rejoice in the same gospel. And the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's the other side of that picture. That we henceforth from now on be no more children tossed to and fro. You know, if you're not established in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the doctrine of Jesus Christ, in the faith, every time some trouble comes, you start wringing your hands, you get discouraged, and you flop from here to there, and all kinds of confusion goes on in your mind because you're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and the cunning and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Now, why don't you go with me now to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to outline the gifts that God gives to us, the practical gifts that God has given to us in this life whereby we may serve Him. He starts off this chapter, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, your job here is to serve me and to sacrifice whatever it takes in order to serve me. So here's the question. Is Jesus Christ and the Lord God Almighty, is He worthy of whatever sacrifice in this life is required to serve Him? Amen. It don't earn you a home in heaven, but it'll get you peace in this life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable when you consider what Jesus Christ has done for you. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means... Live in such a way that you demonstrate the will of God in your life. Now, skip on down for the sake of time, verse number four. For as we have many members in one body, the body of the church, many members in one body. You know why he uses the word members? Because he's about to talk about the various members. You know, the members, like your hand is a member, your head's a member. Your eyes are members. Your feet are members. And I, I have a little bit of understanding about what that is. I'm standing up on somebody else's feet this morning. You know that? My feet are about two-thirds numb. And I, uh, and sometimes I wonder... Never, never mind. Never mind. Every member, every member has a duty in the house of God. Every member has a duty. For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. That means everybody's gift is not the same. He says, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one of another. That means we're all connected together. The hand is connected to my arm, the arm is connected to my shoulder, so far anyway. They keep cutting things off of me, I don't know what's going to be left. Verse number 6. Having then what? What's that next word? Yeah. Having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. That means God has endowed you with a gift, and your gift is different than your gift, is different than your gift, is different than your gift, but we're all part of the same body, right? Amen? Whether, he starts off, whether prophecy. Now, we've already talked about the preacher. You want your preacher, uh, your preacher prophesying, don't you? You want your preacher speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, do you not? You don't want me to get up here and give you a lecture, do you? You know, I've given many lectures in my life. I've given many speeches in my life outside of the Church of Jesus Christ. I, but you didn't come to hear a speech nor a lecture this morning, did you? You came to hear the Spirit of God moving and directing a message from God Almighty, didn't you? All right? Now, he says, whether prophecy. So you want your preachers to prophesy in that context. But now let me tell you something else. He gifts you in varying degrees with the gift of prophecy as well. All right? Let me show you how that works. 
Have you ever had to talk to somebody? And you wonder, now, what am I going to say? This person is troubled. This person is sick. What am I going to say to this person? What do you do when you find that? You pray, Lord, give me what to say to this person. And you keep praying. When you get that person on the phone, and you get off the elevator, you walk in the room, all of a sudden, a thought comes in your mind. Maybe a passage of scripture to share. To share. And you go into that room and you share that thought and the Lord just blesses it. I remember. It, it works. It works in every pursuit of life. God moving in you and guiding you what to do. I walked into a middle school classroom up in Wisconsin. I was substitute teaching up there. And they always put a six foot four ex-military preacher in the room with the most aggravating children. So I walked in a bunch of brawny football player type boys in there. And I mean the substitute was there and it was playtime in heaven from their view. But I walked in that room. <clears throat> I was praying, Lord, bless me to get this under control. I was praying. I, I, I was praying, Lord, get, help me get this under control. So I looked around that room and I picked out the meanest looking boy in that room. I mean he was the hardest case in that room as far as I could tell and I called him up to the front. He was dragging up there. I said, son, I need some help this morning. I said, uh, would you mind to call the road? There's two reasons for that. I want to get the room under control. I want to control him. And also, I, most of them were Scandinavian descent and, and, and Dutch descent, and I couldn't pronounce their names anyway. So, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I said, okay, do that for me. So he just, he just turned around and said, everybody sit down. <laughs> so everybody sat down. He called the name. I never had another liquor problem in that classroom. No. The meanest part. And I had prayed, Lord, to give me what to do. I wanted to, I wanted to get the right guy, too. You know, so the Lord, I, the Lord led me by the Spirit. Your Lord will move within you and give you what to say at the right time, whatever your issue is. Verse number seven, or ministry. Ministry. You want you want your your pastor to be a minister, don't you? You want him to receive a message from God and minister it or serve it to you. You want him to do that, don't you? Uh, whenever you're sick in the hospital, you want your pastor to come and minister the word of God to you to comfort you, do you not? If you lost someone that you love, you want that pastor to come to you and minister to you to encourage you in the word of God. You want that, don't you? But every one of us, in varying degrees, have the gift of ministry. We all have a place in the church to minister it one to another. We come to one another to help one another. To come together to minister to one another is to serve them. What can I do to help you? Uh, can I just sit with you? You've just had surgery. Can I come and help in your home? Uh, can, I, can I do something for you? May I cut your grass for you? May I bring a meal to you? How can I serve you? How can I do something to encourage you? That is the gift of mercy at, uh, at uh, ministry at work. All right? Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. And that means, that, and to wait on our ministry means, you know what the word wait on means? Let me just uh, illustrate it this way. My dad had a say, we all went off to church and we got tired and began to misbehave. Dad would look over and point his finger and say, I will wait on you when we get home. You know, that didn't mean I'm going to sit on you over there and wait for you to get in the house. <laughs> that, that means I'm going to take care of you when we get home. So he said, take care of your ministry. That means spend time. Find out how you can be a help to others and an encouragement and how you can serve the Word of God to others. Or ministering, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching. Now, of course, a pastor is to be your teacher, but uh, in... Uh, in the Word of God, the sisters are taught to teach the youngers and the older uh, brethren to teach the younger brethren. That means spend time with them and teach them to instruct them in how to behave. I remember as a child, uh, those old deacons that I was raised up with, uh, they would spend time with me, they would talk with me, and, and they knew about me and, and my troubles and, and my mistakes and my stumblings, and they would encourage me. They'd put their arms around me and encourage me and help me. They were uh, ministering to me, they were teaching me, they were guiding me, they taught me how to cook, uh, how to fry fish. Um, 
Not that I still want to do it, but they, they taught me how to fry fish, and they taught me how to cook swamp cabbage. You know what that is? I'll tell you the different setting. If you don't know, you're missing the, uh, the joy of your life if you haven't had some good swamp cabbage. They taught me how to cook grits, Sister Laura. Uh, uh, good grits, too. Uh, cheese grits. They taught me how to do that. Uh, they taught me how to set up a tent in the churchyard. They taught me how to come in the church and sit uh, b- beside them and to focus upon the teacher. And when I get a little bit fidgety, they reach over and sort of thump me on the leg. Those were good brethren. They were teaching me how to behave in the house of God. For he not exhorted. Wait on his exhorted. Exhortation. Exhorted means to encourage one another in the word of God. Uh, to tell, there's a, there comes a time uh, that we need to just stop and tell one another how good things the Lord has done for us, right? When somebody's distraught, tell them, uh, remind them. Go and shoot John again. They say, that's what they had to do uh, uh, to the apostle, uh, to the, uh, John the Baptist, go shoot John again those things. There are times when we need to go shoot John again these things. Just go talk to one another about the goodness and the greatness of God. Exhort them, encourage them in their life. Or he that giveth. That giveth. Well, we give to the church. We do that. But we give to one another as well. And this is a part of your gifts that are given to you. We give to one another. If, you need, if somebody needs some financial help, we do that. We give them our time. We give them our love. We give them our encouragement. Uh, we, we give them work if necessary. We give of ourselves. As the Lord has given to us, we give to others to serve them and to help them. And then he says, he that ruleth with digital. That word ruleth comes from a word that means the one that takes charge. A pastor has got to be a person that can take charge. There's no doubt about that. Also, you ordain deacons to take charge of the business of the church. Say amen. Support your deacons. Say amen. We ordain deacons to take uh, uh, care of the business of the church. Amen. Now, we've got some good ones. But you know what? I'll never forget the first fellowship meeting that we had here. Many years ago, we had to have different folks. We'd never done that here. So we had to have different folks take care of different things to get things done because that that year we had about 300 people here. And so I, 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 I selected Sister Von Seal, Buffalo now, and Sister Mabel Bush and put them in charge of the meals. I said, you guys have got it. You just tell the rest of us what we need to do. And those sweet sisters fed 300 people for three days. They were ruling. And if you knew, could have known those sisters in their young years, they could rule, couldn't they? I mean, they could handle it. They were gifted to be able to do it. So each one of us, to varying degrees, have that gift deep within us. All right, let's move on. He says, he that sheweth mercy. That means mercy. That means to run to somebody who needs some help. To show mercy to them. To help them when they cannot help themselves. We'll come to another. I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying as fast as I can. When we get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of the gifts that's lifted there is the gift of healing, which is the same as the gift of mercy. A doctor, a nurse, ministers mercy to a person who cannot help themselves. Could you see me with that knife trying to cut my back open? Scraping off my backbone? Could you see me doing it? I can't do that for myself. Do you think my wife would do that for me? I could answer that. It ain't happening. So the doctors and nurses will minister to me and perform mercy upon me, doing those things for me that I cannot do for them myself. Myself. Also, there are times in the life of our church members that folks are in trouble, they're, they're facing trials or maybe a sickness or whatever it is, and they need some help doing things for them that they cannot do for themselves. I've had the privilege to go pick up somebody and take them to the doctor when they couldn't drive themselves. That's mercy. All right? 
And then he says, with mercy, he says, do it with cheerfulness. Don't say, oh, no, I've got to do that. Oh, no, I've got to do that again. He says, do it with cheerfulness. I'm, j- just think about how God has ministered mercy to me. And so now I get, it is my privilege and my joy I to minister of mercy to someone else. Now turn with me quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, because I've only got three minutes to preach another two hours, I will tell you this. That not only is the gift itself a gift of the church, but the person that has a gift is the gift of the church. You got me? The gift and the person that has the gift is a gift to the church. All right, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul spends the first part of that chapter telling us that there's all kinds of gifts. uses all kinds of words to show you that there's all kinds of gifts. Uh, they're used in different ways. One person uses their gift this way and another one that way. Uh, another one, uh, another way. Uh, God just gives it to us and we use it as God intends for us to use it. And get down to verse number 8. He says, for to one is given the Spirit, uh, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. That means some folks, you know, some folks are just very smart. And they can analyze a problem and come to a good conclusion. In the house of God, some people are very smart, they're very talented, they have good wisdom, and you can and uh, you can go to them. I, I go to them in counsel all the time. I go to the brethren often in counsel because they have wisdom. Some one way and some another way. The word of wisdom. Some can understand the word of God and explain it so that even a, a dummy like me can understand it. He says another, the word of knowledge. There are some people that just know a lot of things. I've known people, I've known people that would just spend their life reading encyclopedias. You're not a person like that? I've had people work for me in times past who knew a lot of things. It's good to have that person at the conference table, I promise you. Because you can glean a lot of information. They may not know what to do with it, but they've got the knowledge. If you've got one person over here that's got the knowledge, and another one over here has got the wisdom, and you can get them talking together, you can come to a good conclusion, can't you? That's the way it is in the house of God. We work together. All right, one to the word of knowledge, and but it's all by the same spirit. And you know, we're like a house fit together, fitly framed together, to another faith. That means, uh, in this context, to another faith, that means some people say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can face whatever trouble there is ahead of me, and I know that my God is going to uh, just see me through it. And another person say, you know, that, I, I, you know, I like that. That makes me feel good. I see that person just enduring tribulation and trial, and they don't give up. They keep going. That encourages one another, fitly framed together. Some is better at it than others. To another faith, and it's by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing. There's that word healing. You know, over my years, the 30 years of my ministry, I spent a lot of time in hospitals and doctor's offices. And you know that there are doctors that ain't. There are nurses that ain't. You can spend a little time watching them, and you can see, and you can pick out, uh, and pretty quickly, the ones who are there just collecting a paycheck, and those who are doing it because they have a God-given gift of healing. Some is just part of their nature. I could give you some recent examples from our storm, but I won't do that this morning. Verse number 10, to another, the working of miracles. Now, back during the biblical times, at the beginning of the church, there were many miracles done. There were people raised to life from the dead. All kinds of miracles were done. But you know that, that that gift of miracles still abides in the church. Have you ever just been so distraught, haven't told anybody, and somebody just called you on the phone and just said, I just had a mind to call you and say this to you. You never said anything to them. But it's a miracle to God working in their mind and heart to put in their mind and heart to do for you what you needed at that time. That's a miracle. Because other than God moving, you cannot explain it. Then another one, discerning the spirits. To discern the spirits means that there are some folks who are talented, uh, 
Preachers and deacons need to be like this. Also, law enforcement officers need to be like this. Need to be able to look at somebody, uh, talk to them a little bit, and discern what kind of spirit is motivating them. Sometimes it's not a good spirit, I promise you. Some folks are just mean. You know, there are some people that just mean to the core. And then there are some that just mean and they're covering up the goodness. And then there are some that's good just covering up the mean. Deserting the spirits uh, uh, is a gift that God gives to some to be able to understand these things. Then divers types of tongues. On, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the tongues on that day was those men preached in one language and it was heard in multitudes of other languages. All the time, almost every other case where the gift of tongues is used, it means that, that uh, when you went to a place, if I were to go down to Peru, my Spanish is so limited, I, 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 could, I couldn't preach in Spanish. But if I wanted to preach there in Peru, I would have to find me somebody to interpret for me, and would they be able to take, because to them, I would be speaking in tongues. I mean, I, they couldn't understand what I was saying. A lot of times, some folks from, uh, that can speak English can't understand what I'm saying. But speaking in tongues is speaking in one language and somebody else not being able to hear it in another language. And Paul's going to tell us some have the gift of interpretation. We'll get to it in just a moment. He says, the interpretation, the next one to another, the interpretation of the, it takes a special person, a special gift to be able to hear and then immediately interpret what they heard. I can't remember it that long. If I don't have time to write it down on a piece of paper, I don't have it remembered. That's the reason I carry this card in my pocket. You tell me something, just remind me to write it on my card because if I don't write it on my card, I have a card. Could you see me interpreting? It just wouldn't happen. But that's a gift of God. Verse number 11. But all these worketh that, uh, that one and the same Spirit. That means the same Spirit uh, is working to give everybody their gift. Now, <coughs> I want you to skip over for the second time. Verse number 28. And God has uh, set some in the church. These other persons. First, apostles. And we've talked about the office of the apostles. But there are those that God just simply sends to do His will. Amen? All right? Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Helps. There's one he hasn't listed before. Just helping somebody. I mean... Uh, you know, some people are just gifted in helping others. I mean, they're just right ready to help somebody. Whatever a person needs, they'll just help and say, can I help you? Can I help you? We saw that a lot after, uh, after Hurricane Michael uh, tore our community apart. There were folks out there just helping each other. As I traveled around over this community, there were people out there just walking around with chainsaws, and they'd cut and they were out of gas, and then somebody else would have some gas, help them with some gas. Uh, there were people helping each other, uh, taking them into their homes, they were feeding them, they were clothing them, they were helping one another. Then government, that's the same as one that ruleth. And then diversities of tongues. That means in those days there were those, I mean, when they would go out and, uh, uh, and preach to the community, uh, they, they, were, they could speak multiple languages. Shoot, I don't, I don't have enough active brain cells to preach uh, in, um, um, in one country and then go preach in another and then another. I'd have to have interpreters. But the Apostle Paul, he could speak multiple languages and preach the gospel in multiple languages in multiple places. That man could speak in tongues. That means in various languages. That was a gift given by God to him. Now, I want to close with this. This is in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10. He says, As every man hath received the gift. Are you ready? Now, I've said a lot. Covered a lot of territory. But this brings it together. As every man, by, by the way, you, you sisters do know, I hate to say this, 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 every man means the mankind, means all of us. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister or serve the same one to another. That means you're fitly framed together in the house of God. As God has gifted you, you use that gift to serve one another. As good stewards 
of the manifold grace of God. As God has been gracious to us, we need to be gracious to each other. As God has poured out His mercy upon us, we need to in turn pour it out to help one another, to encourage one another, and to be ready to, to stand upon the faith of Jesus Christ and declare His glory, to, uh, declare His majesty, and declare salvation by the grace of God as a gift of God and not by works. May God bless you, my God.